These days, it's relatively easy to burn a CD. If you don't have a burner, you can just buy one for almost nothing, and your PC almost certainly provides an interface for it on the motherboard, be it SATA or USB, depending on which way you want to go with this. Windows itself, and I'd imagine any other modern operating system like uh, Mac OS X or Linux even, I would think, makes it pretty much as simple as dragging your files to the disk like any other Explorer window and hitting burn. Audio CDs can be made by most newer media players, and most decent video editing packages can create DVD video discs, which are kind of the lowest common denominator now. Nobody really uses video CD anymore, and it never caught on in the UK really anywhere, as far as I'm aware. I sure as hell knew nobody who had it, and most people kept VHS well into the 2000s. Well, bloody hell, I'm here to talk about burning CDs. More like burning my damn skin. <laughs> I'm filming this outside to show you how damn warm it is. So, if my voiceover sounds a little bit slurred and stuff in places, well, yeah, I don't handle this weather well. What do you think? Look how pale I am. I'm, I'm a damn nerd. I live inside and it, I live in Britain. It, most of the time there's like four inches of water all over the ground and it's grey. Everything's grey in Britain. It's boring. But yeah, uh, obviously as the title of the video, we're going on about burning CDs under Windows 3.1. I haven't forgotten about the Pentium Pro video, but I want to do something smaller after that awful K6. And to be honest, in this weather, I'm not up to much more and I already have most of the footage for it. I took it when I installed the damn thing, so yeah, this one should be easy by comparison, <laughs> assuming I don't die of heat stroke or something before it's done. So let's get on with it before I pass out from the heat. Life on a council estate. It's one I wouldn't give it up for the world, man. For a moment, let's pretend that it's the early 2000s again. Uh, kind of sucks, because I don't really like that era that much, really. There's a lot of crappy people around for some reason around that time. I'm looking at you, Gary Jules, ruining a good song. Donnie Darko, I heard that film. I still have my first DVD burner. I was quite late to the party, and the technology was really quite well established by this time, but hey, you know, I was doing things on pocket money. The burner came in at just over £300, which would have been about $550 US dollars as it stood then. This did include software for the drive, and the prices dropped massively as time went on. Quite quickly, actually. If I'd waited just a few months, it would have cost a hell of a lot less. The operating principles of the drives are the same as any drive you could buy today, only it used an IDE interface, mostly as SATA didn't really quite exist yet, it was still little more than an idea that was being played with somewhere. So yeah, parallel ATA was the order of the day really. Now rewind a bit further to the later part of the 1990s, and you'd be paying four figure numbers. If you were making video DVDs, the V stands for versatile, not video in DVD, you might need additional hardware. To play back the MPEG-2 video stream, you might have needed a dedicated decoder. These were similar to the scenic MPEG-1 decoder that we looked at a while ago. It was a short-lived market for, like, cards which decoded video streams in real time. This was primarily because CPUs weren't really quick enough to do it very well yet in a lot of systems. Now if you produce DVD video quite often, say if you were an independent filmmaker or some such, well you might have had to invest in a dedicated encoder, because as I said, Pentium 2 era processors weren't really that great at encoding MPEG-2 video. I mean, they will do it, and Pentium 2s especially, very stable processors. They'll get there, but it's not going to be very fast. A lot of the cost, really, for the software and the hardware was down to licensing these proprietary technologies and libraries. This was mostly irrelevant, as almost nobody earned DVD burners at this time anyway. In fact, few people earned CD burners. 
The technology was at least standardizing quickly by this point, though, and the fact that drives were moving over to parallel ATA and interface present in almost every machine of the time did pave the way for them to become cheaper and much, much more abundant in the coming years. In 1995, practically nobody owned a CD burner, but you might have been able to get one. The burners themselves dropped to below a thousand US dollars for the first time. But only just. With a 995 US dollar price tag, it wasn't something you'd just impulse buy on a whim, really, was it? I mean, you'd better be certain you were going to use the thing and that it would actually work. And this was just the cost of the burner. You'd need a machine capable of using it properly unless you wanted to create some really interesting coasters. Plus, the hardware to support it wasn't cheap. Recordable CD-ROMs were also quite costly sometimes upwards of five dollars for a single disc. You can buy a hundred discs for that today, and granted they won't be very good discs, but yeah, still, that's uh, how things have changed in the, the, the years since. And to be honest, if we adjusted for inflation, yeah, obviously it's going to come out as more. Now, circa 1992, you could buy a burner for around ten thousand dollars. Yeah, that's what a great price that is. That's the cost of a decent car, or like a van or something. Actually, you know, if we account for inflation, that's about 17,500 US dollars today. According to Google, I could buy a brand new Fiat 500 right now for less than this. But I'm not a girl, so I won't. That's not so bad, really. I mean, I told you, $10,000... Pretty good bargain there, because in 1990 you'd be looking at closer to $35,000 just for the basic burner components. These early burners were pretty bulky external devices and were essentially their own system. You would need a computer for control, but that's not included in the price. Uh, fairly Modest 286 was still around $800 in 1990, but you'd need a SCSI controller, and even then... I'm not entirely confident that this 286 would be powerful enough. Fancy going for the 386 option? Well, yeah, hell. Couple of grand out the window there. And to think, the 486 was nearly a year old already. I'm not even going to look at how much that cost. But, yeah, you can see, this wasn't cheap. And I'm not even including the odd external parity circuitry and stuff you apparently needed to do this. It, early CD burners are not very well documented, so, yeah, some of this may be inaccurate. I've tried to do my best. If you find something better than I know, uh, feel free to share it. But, yeah, you, you can kind of see why businesses use tapes to back things up. You, it, it was just the most practical option. You'd even be surprised how many still do it. Optical discs really weren't practical yet, and tapes, well, they've endured this long for really these these factors that make them appealing for backing things up. They last a long time. They have a massive capacity compared to most other mediums that are easy to operate in that way. And they're just basically a workhorse. You, you can stuff them in a drive and they just work. They're proven. They've been around a long time, much longer than CDs. So, yeah, they've stuck around this long. It probably is worth making a distinction between burning and pressing when producing CDs. A large-scale production, such as that used by the music industry, does not use burning, but instead uses pressing. I'm not going to go into the details, although I think it's somewhat self-explanatory by the term. Uh, this method simply wouldn't be practical for most people unless you were running thousands of the same CD. This is referred to as replication by a press, as opposed to duplication by a burner like you would do at home. The discs used by presses are also physically different, which is why the CDs you bought are silver instead of the odd bluish tint found in recordable discs. It is a different material. Now, I would like to mention that when I talked about replication and duplication, uh, oh, there is another, like, sort of in the middle means of producing many CDs. You see, uh, replication, as we said, was for its, its large-scale commercial CD production. You use it for selling, like, studio albums and stuff that are just going to be mass-produced. Like, you're going to sell a million copies or something, you'll get a bunch of CD replicators. The short version of how it works is they make a master disc out of glass, 
and they just press a bunch of identical CDs. It's much better to do it that way if you want loads and loads of discs quickly. It's Obviously you can only use the Glass Master so many times, but glass is fairly strong and it, it works well enough against the material that's been pressed into. So that is how you know, CDs from big name music labels and such will be made. Uh, obviously duplication is what you can do at home with a burner and there is another stage of duplication where and I'm sure quite a few of you will have seen them even if you've never used one uh, I kind of wish I'd filmed the one in that studio I was dicking around in a few years ago but I, I, I think I might have done but yeah the footage is lost uh, and I, I, if, I'm sure I didn't film it properly I think it was just a oh cool a, you know, a CD duplicator but Basically, they're about, usually about the size of a mid ATX like chassis, but they're just all five and a quarter inch slots. They have a power supply which is pretty much the same as an AT power supply, just with no connector for a motherboard, it's just loads of Molexes. It gets filled full of CD drives. They're usually scuzzy, but they probably made them for other interfaces as well. Uh, especially by now, because they don't make scuzzy cards. They're probably eSATA or SAS or even USB, I would think, is adequate for writing CDs now. Uh, yeah, let's let's do one over a, a serial port. Let's see. <laughs> I don't think that's going to work very well. Let's be honest. But yeah, you you load all the drives up. The drives are all the same. You load them with blank discs, and you can produce you know, maybe ten of the same disc in one go. They're used in smaller studios, and, you know, for smaller bands or like. I've seen computer stores even use them when they build their own machines. Obviously they're not going to build loads and loads of machines, but they'll want a disc with whatever crap they're including with the machine or whatever so the user can restore it. And because they're building like a decent number of the same machine, they'll use one of those to produce the discs with the drivers on for the customers. And That's not very common, but I have seen it done. So yeah, I figured it would just worth pointing out that there is another stage in this and there's probably a few other things we don't know about it's kind of weird how the earlier you go like pretty much anything prior to the point that we're looking in at here the documentation gets very very patchy until there's practically none uh, early cds are just not well documented at all at least as far as producing them went so yeah that's kind of strange i i don't really know why that is possibly just because it wasn't generally available to the public and so nobody ever really wrote it down. I, I don't doubt you could get a commercial grade replicator if you had the money. You, you probably could just buy one and put it in your house but it's not at all practical for just making the odd compilation disc or something. They're, they're not really built for that. You, you probably could do it but you'd end up with loads of copies you didn't want and then you'd have to make another glass master disc and you just throw all these resources away for nothing so there's probably something to do with it anyway let's get on with this and go back to that boring narrator guy uh, before I like get sick of talking to the camera and end up just as boring as he is hang on that guy's me it's kind of cool I suppose and yeah like I say you can find this information on the internet and read up about if you're interested but it's not what we're talking about here the machine i will be using could have existed in 1994 but only just i think it's a good time to point out that channels like mine are inherently inaccurate quite often and it's something i do want to start touching upon more often we always tend to show best case scenarios when in reality you almost certainly would not have earned the machine like zoe here in 1994 now, to support this burner, a Panasonic CW7502, we need several requirements to be met by the system we're going to be installing it in. See, it's not as simple as just buying a burner and stuffing it into your 3860X40. Yeah, the, the 3860X40 rules, but it's just not that simple. Your system needs to be capable of handling the burner properly. So firstly, we need a fast CPU. My burner is from a little later than the rest of the machine, and it officially requires a 75 MHz Pentium, something you could get in 1994, but I'm not even brave enough to go back and see how much that would have set you back. I know we've looked at it before, but yeah, it was expensive, because they'd just come out, and uh, mm, don't fancy it personally. 
So we are only at 66 megahertz here, but the system bus is faster as the 75 megahertz Pentium's only got a 50 megahertz bus. Mine's running out to full 66, so that should make up for it. Should be enough. Uh, secondly, we're going to need loads and loads of RAM. About 16 to 32 megabytes is recommended. It was quite a lot back then. I have 64 megabytes of parity RAM installed, and yeah, we're going to need that. Some burners might explicitly recommend parity, which, as you can imagine, is going to cost more than normal memory, assuming you were buying this new at the time. Similarly, we need SCSI, and that SCSI bus needs to support parity. Some burners, this one included, will work without it, and they have an option to not use it, but this could cost in the reliability department, and I'd recommend just having it there if you don't want to waste CDs and make more coasters. For the record, optical drives in general weren't something you would have seen all that much in a machine in 1994. A common way to purchase them at the time was by getting your hands on a multimedia kit. These included a sound card, speakers, and a CD-ROM drive. That CD-ROM drive interfaced to the sound card, usually, and... Well, we could do that here, because my Pro Audio Spectrum 16 provides a SCSI interface, and it does work. But this introduces another problem, where it requires more drivers to be loaded into base memory. The thing is, there's not a lot of base memory, so we don't want to do that here, because some applications don't really like having to share such a limited amount of space with all these SCSI managers and such. And, well, this was a common thing in DOS. Yeah, this is why I recommend using boot menus like what I have set up, so you're not loading things you don't need loaded when you have more memory-intensive applications running. I mean, Duke Nukem 2 doesn't use a CD drive, so why load the drivers for it, right? So instead, I have my burner connected to the narrow bus on my Adeptex SCSI card. My hard drive is connected to the wide bus. Wide SCSI was a brand new technology at the time, and yeah, you'll have a hard time finding one of the original cards. Mine is newer, but functions identically here. The evasiveness of the very fast ones suggests to me the outlay for such a device was probably incredibly high. Now, I can hear some of you asking me, why not just use IDE? Well, the answer is that most CD-ROM drives were either using proprietary interfaces or else SCSI. So having a SCSI burner wasn't in common. In fact, early on, the only interface for burners was SCSI. At this time, Enhanced IDE, a revision to the IDE standard, which added some enhancements, you know, who would have guessed, had only just been introduced and was the first version of the interface to really support optical drives at all. The reason burners didn't use it is actually discussed on the box for my burner. In short, IDE puts too much strain on the system, creating significant processor overhead and generally being slow anywhere. IDE at this time would have been absolutely crap for running a burner, and you'd need a much faster machine and several more updates to the IDE interface before you could really get any use out of it in this regard. You're also going to need a good power supply to run all of this high-performance hardware because yeah, it saps power. SCSI hard drives draw significantly more current than the EIDE and ESDI, which was still around, counterparts, especially the higher RPM models, and they get quite hot. CD burners also use far more than a CD reader. This one can draw over 25 watts on the 5 volt rail alone. But, I mean, we are firing lasers in there, so, well, at least it's going to good use because lasers are awesome. Now, you need the software to support your burner. Firstly, Windows 3.1 needs drivers to be loaded in DOS, because that's how Windows 3.1 does a lot of things. Uh, an ASPI layer, that's ASPI, I'm not insulting people with Asperger's Syndrome. Uh, but yes, you need an ASPI layer, ASPI manager, and a CD-ROM driver. At this stage, you can use the burner as a normal reader. In fact, these ASPI drivers are the same ones you'd use for a reader, and DOS is none the wiser regarding your drive's capabilities. It'll just read disks until the cows come home. There's, there's literally no difference in this part of the setup. Beyond that, we now need Windows 3.1, as that's what we're trying to use to burn disks under. I mean, it'd be a bit daft trying to burn disks under Windows 3.1 if we just install Windows 95, wouldn't it? 
I mean, it would probably be a lot easier. And we're going to have to install some software under Windows 3.1, as was kind of inevitable. Firstly, you need another Aspie layer for Windows, and this varies by device. In my case, I have to use Adaptech Easy SCSI because I'm using an Adaptech SCSI card. This was paid software, and it's quite hard to find now, especially in 16 bit variants. So, yeah, uh, don't know why the hell that hasn't really been kept hold of as well as certain other utilities around. It took me a long time to track it down. Now this is what the burner software will talk to, and it does have to be installed for that software to work. Easy SCSI might be worth installing anyway though if you're using a SCSI hard drive with a supported Adaptech SCSI card, because it can enable 32-bit disk access and buffering which is otherwise disabled. It actually does yield a noticeable performance boost on my system, so it's sure as hell worth looking into if you're confident you're not going to have power loss in the middle of a disk access. Easy SCSI often includes other utilities, such as a CD player. It has a disk benchmark too, and some really neat tools for perking the SCSI bus around, stuff like that. It's not really that bad. Now we need software to operate the Barna. The dominant software at this time was Easy CD Creator, initially by Incat Systems, but later bought by Adaptech. Supposedly it still exists as Roxio Creator, although I imagine it's been vastly updated by now. As Adaptech Easy CD, it was available in a few different flavours, namely Light, Standard, and Pro. Often included were tools to make covers, photo CDs, and a few other things. My version of Easy CD was fresh from an interface update, and it looks usable enough. I certainly think we could make audio and data CDs with it anyway, without having any real issues. So I guess it does what it says on the tin. I haven't played with the photo CD and cover creator kind of stuff, but yeah, Easy CD was my main goal. I want to burn data and audio. Looks like it would do that quite well. There's just one problem, it doesn't work with my burner. Until the mid-2000s, and possibly later, but I haven't bought really a burner with bundled software since, it wasn't uncommon to lock the software down to only work with one drive. Commonly, the drive the software was bundled with. I mean, it would be a bit deaf to lock it down to the drive that it wasn't bundled with. Unfortunately, I don't have the disk that came bundled with my drive, but that's not the problem with Easy CD here. They've not actually restricted it at all. The version I have just supports common burners of the time. But it's just a bit behind supporting the burner I have. You see, these things weren't standardised all that well yet, and so the software has to specifically support your CD burner. You could look it up on a compatibility list, so you didn't waste your money buying the software only for it to not work, but... Yeah, it doesn't support mine, so, well, we're screwed on that front. And in case you're wondering, I don't have the compatibility list for this version, so I had nowhere to know until I installed it. Uh, yeah, don't know where the compatibility list is. Uh, I, last, I, I couldn't find an archive of the, the web address that it tries to link you to. Still, at this time, there was a new kid on the block, some upstart from Germany, calling themselves a head software. I don't know, I mean, you might have heard of them. So Nero versions up to at least 4.0.3.0 will work under Windows 3.1, but only for SCSI drives and obviously only drives listed in the README. You will also need Win32S installed for versions this late on, and a working serial key for them. It can try to use unsupported burners, but you need the original disk, and I don't have it, and I can't find one. Ahead, look, I'm sorry I pirated your software, I will buy the disc if you will sell it to me, otherwise what am I supposed to do? You haven't sold this for over a decade, you're losing no money, and yeah, I don't know what the hell else I'm supposed to do, man. They tell you not to pirate, but then they leave you no choice. It's kind of, kind of awkward, man. I guess we could class it as abandonware or something. Mm, I don't know. Still, according to that list, my burner is supported, so here we go. The interface might get messed up visually depending on the resolution and video card configuration, but it's fine for me. Could bump up the screen resolution, but 
yeah, I, I can't be bothered. I'd have to set it back for some of the video hardware in the machine to be usable again anyway. It's kind of precarious, this thing. And I... Uh, and to be honest, it's not that bad. Most of the interface looks fine. It's just this pin on the left-hand side when you first start it up. I'd, I'm happy to ignore it. Nero kept this interface for quite a while. I think even Nero 8 still included good old Nero burning ROM with the same basic interface. We can create audio and data CDs like an easy CD. We can do a few things, actually, but yeah, both of them also handle image files. However, some versions of Easy CD allow you to emulate a CD drive with them. You get a kind of, uh, you know, CD drive emulation, kind of image drive. Nero doesn't appear to do this, uh, but it can open them and it can write them to the hard drive. Uh, of course, the average hard drive in 1994 wasn't really large enough to handle a bunch of CD images, so yeah... That poor wallet is looking increasingly anemic. Another notable thing is, uh, yeah, a lot of this software from back then surprisingly can rip audio CDs, but obviously just to WAV files and such, you're not going to be ripping them to MP3s. And even if you did rip them to MP3s, I imagine it'd take quite a while with the processors of the time. Overall, with disk creation and the varying types of disks you can create, you're going to be at the mercy of the burner as to what is supported. But yeah, this part's really simple. Once you've selected the type of disk you want to make, drag in what you want on the disk, and then save the project, save an image, or burn it to a disk. I can't lie, I mean, this is actually quite nerve-wracking. Burning a disk puts a lot of stress on a system like this. It demands a lot from the CPU. It demands a lot from the bus. It demands a lot from the memory and the power supply. If something's going to break in there, it's going to break now. At the very least, you are going to pick up on it if you have any inadequacies in the system, any deficiencies. But for underrun protection, wasn't a thing yet. So, yeah, it's a real risk here. The write buffer must be fed constantly on that burner. If the system cannot keep up, the buffer will empty. Which is what buffer underrun is, that's what it means. A modern drive with underrun protection will just wait for the buffer to fill up again, turn the laser off until it does. But older drives, such as this one, can't do this. Therefore, if that buffer does empty, the laser keeps going, potentially corrupting the disk, or at the very least, wasting space on the disk, and if it goes beyond the end of the disk, well, then you're just going to get another coaster to add to the collection. Overall, it seems wise not to touch anything whilst the system is burning a CD, because you probably will upset something. I mean, we're probably utilising most everything it has anyway. I'd be amazed if anything was particularly usable, and it would do nothing short of just failing the burn process. Simulation complete. Now we just have to wait for that burn indicator to light and hope it goes well. Uh, this is a quad speed burner, so yeah, it can burn at around 600k per second. And yes, you're correct, that means an old single speed burner is limited to a quarter of this at only 150k per second. To there, this is actually the most inconvenient thing should a burn fail. Compact discs are cheap enough that I'd have no problem just wasting the odd one. But the burn process takes a long time, and you're not going to get that time back. Still, they weren't lying. It does deliver the rated speed, which is more than I can say for that piece of crap in my laptop. 24 speed by ass. I've hardly seen it do 16. Awful drives. I get that a lot now. False advertising. Boo. Now, there is a notable point here. This drive doesn't support CD rewritable disks. It is a CD writer and not a CD rewriter. That's the difference. At best, you may be able to burn to a CD rewritable disk. I, I don't think it would work, but yeah, you, you're certainly not going to be able to erase it in this drive, and I imagine it could cause problems for burners that are supposed to. Who even uses those discs, though? I mean, the amusing thing is how now I could literally just waste regular recordables on purpose, and I could waste more of them than a CD rewritable disc has guaranteed write-erase cycles and still be saving money. It's ridiculous. 
So, yeah, there is no going back. Once you've hit barn, either you're creating a coaster or you're barning what you've said you're barning to the disc. There, there is no, no ifs or buts about it with this thing. Now, whilst we wait for it to barn, there's a few other things I'd like to talk about with this whole thing. One reason I use a newer barner than maybe I should is because of an issue regarding older drives. You see, early on, these burners had a specific power level, and discs tended to vary in physical makeup, and I imagine they still do to some degree. Therefore, discs from one brand might not have worked in a burner from another brand. This one proudly states that it is immune to this obstacle on the box. Another reason I used it is simply because it was the cheapest SCSI optical drive on eBay, and I quite like the challenge of trying to get it to work, to be honest. Uh, there is another reason I used it, and I'm going to point that out at the end. Now, another point to note with this whole thing, though, for now, is that we're not really done with software, because if you care about your Windows installation, you'll almost certainly want to run something like Ghost to back it up before you start messing around with this stuff. Those were the files I burned to the disk, the uh, hard drive images I took, one from before and one from after the burner was installed. You see, this machine's extremely complicated, it's packed full of weird video hardware and audio hardware, devices which require very specific settings before they will work. If one thing is upset, one setting is wrong, the whole thing comes crashing down quite catastrophically. Easy Scuzzy does tamper with the MCI drivers and a few other things, but all I've managed to do in installing it is break CD player back in Windows Media Player due to just a version mismatch with something. I can fix it, but I use the MediaVision application anyway, and that still works. I also know that with such an overblown machine, tampering with things is probably just going to be chasing a bubble in the wallpaper. We'll pop it out the side, five more will appear, and... Yeah, we'll just be stuck messing with it forever. If that's the worst problem we've got, I'm just going to leave it alone. And I think you'll uh, appreciate the whole thing there and, yeah, understand why I'm not inclined to fix such a minor issue that quickly. Now, when you think of what I said, how you wouldn't own this machine in 1994 then, and considering what we've just said about the hardware, I really should do a systems updated video someday to show how hardware has changed since we initially saw things, because I've got a few machines that have changed since. Well, yeah, this thing, the it would have been probably well into five-figure numbers, I would bet, when it was new. Yeah, I'm pretty certain you probably wouldn't have had one of these on your street in 1994 unless you were rich or something but then i would have thought rich people had better things to do in 1994 so yeah i, I don't know oh the drive does get rather warm as well we're sure dissipating those watts pretty well in there aren't we yeah we're, we are burning a disc a statement that's not too far from the truth. Essentially, the laser melts bobbles on the disc into what they call pits and lands. This is a well-documented process, and it should be easy to find online if you want to read up about it. I'm not going to go into it here. It's actually not as complicated as you'd think in principle, but yeah, I imagine actually getting it to work probably took quite a lot of research and trial and error on the part of the original inventors. Now, there's a couple of points I probably should go over very quickly. Uh, firstly, in 1994, when the machine we were using in this video was made, having the internal optical drive wasn't a very common thing. I think I said as much. Uh, you know, but, yeah, if you want to fork out for one, you might have done. Now, if you went back a little farther, a lot of optical drives were external. They'd use SCSI. They'd use even the parallel port, which... Parallel ports aren't that quick. In ECP mode, I think they can actually do about 2 meg per second, which would have been fast enough for a drive at that time. It would have probably been alright. Uh, at least outward. I don't know about back in. I'll have to look into that. I'm not too sure. I haven't dabbled with that in a while. But early burners, uh, like I said, hard drives were quite small as well. And So you had an internal optical drive by then. Uh, by the late 90s, an internal burner was something people would have done. Like, burners weren't common, but if you had one, probably installed it in the machine by then. Uh, unless you were on, like, an older machine or something, I don't know. But before that, you'll notice if you know SCSI very well, you almost always have uh, a connector coming out. This is a 
2940 UW Pro. It's like the next card or a couple of models are from the one that's in the PC. And it's basically the same. It's a couple of extra bells and whistles I'm not going to use. Uh, it's for a different machine. It was just cheapest one at the time. But, and they work, <laughs> the 2940s. Don't have problems with them. They all seem to just work. So I like those cards. Now your Barney would have probably stuck in that socket on the back. Even my Pentium 3 can do that, and that's a bit different. The, the cable's like a Y. Uh, one goes off to an expansion slot, which just has that connector on it. Uh, and the other end of the cable goes to the hard drives and the Terminator. And not all SCSI adapters can do that, but yeah, you, you can double end the SCSI bus on some of them, and evidently that one supports it. Don't use that cable in there, but I, I do have it, it's the one that came with the motherboard. And that's how you would have probably done the Barney, you would have stuffed it in a big caddy outside the machine. And yeah, you'd probably been able to copy CDs a bit better like that as well, because you wouldn't have had to put them on hard drive in the middle of things, it would have just been moving them over. I, I'm not sure how that would work out. I might have to get an external reader or something set up and see if we can do it, because I'm not sure we could, but it seems logical the drive would probably have been external early on. And in fact the earliest burners definitely were. Uh, at least the ones you could use with a PC. Uh, the, the earliest, earliest burners weren't necessarily PC exclusive, like you like, they made burners for apples. You could install these in an Apple machine, I'm pretty certain. I, I don't know a lot about Apple, but I, I'm almost certain you could install a burner in one and use it. There was definitely software for it. But, yeah, the very earliest, uh, the computer just controlled things. The whole thing was outside and it was huge. The earliest PC burners were probably... I have seen one, I don't have the rights to use the picture, but it's sort of like a Model 2 Sega CD setup, but sort of mirrored and beige with no cartridge slot, lid does lift up, and yeah, it runs on SCSI, it sits outside, you wouldn't be able to fit in the machine, it's just clearly purpose built, way too big, it's, it's just the, what it is for that one purpose. And, that's clearly just how things were done at that point. By the time the drive in here was made, it was about 96, 97 then, yeah, putting them in the machine was probably getting a bit more, we'll say common, but earning a burner was still a, a pretty obscure thing to do. Not many people did. Anyways, uh, I'll get back to wherever we're going to awkwardly wedge this in the video. Well, 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 the burn's about done, and holy crap, apparently was successful. So, well, can I actually read this disc in another machine? It would certainly appear so. So to confirm this, I copied the files over the network and ran FC on them. They come back identical. There's not a single difference between the files on the machine they started on and on the disc. Now, there's something really weird about that. The whole concept of this machine in that it's actually put something physical into this world that is now not a part of itself. It's like there is a part of the machine which now exists beyond the machine. It has left an imprint on something else in the world. I don't know, there's just something odd about that, that just something my head can't quite get used to about taking a disc out of a machine with more than 20 years on the clock and then reading that disc in a system which is nearly brand new. Uh, I mean, I know it's just burning a disc, but yeah, it's just the the thing of... I don't know, man. It just kind of brings back a feeling of when CDs were still this magical, futuristic technology and you knew that one guy on the estate who had a burner... You know, the, the local pirate guy who just used to sell you shit discs that never really worked right. That's that's really what it's making me think of for some reason, but it's, yeah, it's just weird. It, it just seems so strange doing this. Hey, you know what sucks? As yet, this drive hasn't made a single cursor. Yet the burner on my laptop's made several. Yet, yeah, sure, the MTBF, which is mean time between failures, is quite scary to look at, as I'm certain we've probably spun the dial around a few times over by now. So, yeah, damn this thing's reliable, and 
It even handles multi-session disks. Haven't had those go wrong yet. I thought it would protest that at the very least it would bitch at me. But no, it's just worked every single time. Uh, still, I have to admit, there is no real point to this because, well, burners are cheaper and easier to use and faster now. In fact, they're pretty much everywhere. I'm pretty certain you could get a burner for free and you can certainly get the software for free. It just plug it in and it goes. Which, I guess, is for the best, really. I mean, I prefer shit that just works to things that are complicated and might not work. At least when I need them. I don't mind when it's something like this where it's novelty value. Then it's then it's kind of fun. I like the challenge. So, yeah, if you're on an older machine, maybe don't go running out to buy an old burner. But there could be one advantage, because burners are somewhat more tolerant to burned discs versus the regular CD readers that sometimes only like pressed discs, as in originals, not backups. In this case, the IDE drives are going to be a lot cheaper and easier to get hold of. And I'm going to tell you something, and now you're probably wondering when burners moved over to IDE. Apparently, even this version of Nero will let you use IDE burners in Windows 95 and up. Windows 3.1, I've heard conflicting reports, but in generally it doesn't like doing that kind of thing. It won't burn with IDE burners. And as I said, you're going to have an easier time in 95 upwards anyway. I, I don't know why anybody would torture themselves with this other than me, but I doubt anybody's that crazy yet. However, IDE burners technically use a TAPI. That's A-T-A-P-I. A-T Attachment Packet Interface. I could go technical, but in its most simple terms, guess what? It's just SCSI over IDE, nothing more. So yeah, burners are still SCSI. Your IDE burner is actually pretty much talking SCSI. It's talking near enough the same language as my SCSI one is here. It just uses different electrical signalling. Got a SATA burner? Yep, it's almost certainly going to be a tappy again, scuzzy over serial ATA, right? In fact, probably gonna have a USB burner. It's probably just a USB to SATA adapter, and guess what protocol it uses? Yeah, you guessed it. You can use scuzzy commands on almost any protocol. Today, iSCSI is often used for storage area networks. It, you're basically emulating a scuzzy bus over TCP IP. So, yeah, this, this technology's been around a long time now. Now, my last words are things to the effect of older SCSI optical drives often use these little caddies. I don't have much to say about that beyond, well, they're kind of nice. Overall, a lot of these old drives were overblown as hell. I mean, look at this thing. How garish is that? I mean, I absolutely love it, but yeah, I think they went a bit far there, really. I mean, you don't really need that kind of stuff, but I'll, I'll take it anyway. Also, who the hell left this CD in my burner? Yeah, it came with this. I mean, it, that's kind of cool to see in a way, because it seems to have been written in this burner sometime in the 90s, assuming the timestamps are correct, which they might not be. Unfortunately, the music is absolutely shite. Some ugly British bitch trying to sound like she's from the southern United States or some shit. Bloody Beth Orton. I, I don't know. I never heard of her. It, probably when all the neo-country and crap was taken off at the end of the 90s. I hated that shit. I, I really hated that crap, man. It, it, it needs to stay dead. So yeah, overall, I think I'll just stick to Jim, Jenny, and the Pine Tops. Thank you very much, because that's awesome. Or, or at the very least, I'll listen to some Boxcar Willy. I don't need this Beth Orton shit. It's terrible. Beth Orton. I mean, who the hell is Beth Orton anyway? I mean, she's probably like a turtle, turtle like dork or something, right? Just like puts American flags and like Confederate flags on her wall, like even though she's British. I mean, you know, only a turtle dork would do something like it. All oh, right. Uh. Well, yeah, anyway. <laughs> hmm. That's kind of awkward. So, why did I buy this burner specifically? Uh, other than the fact that it dodged the problem with uh, not being guaranteed to work with most discs. Because this one works with the bargain bin ones from Pound Stretcher quite happily. Well, it was the cheapest optical drive on eBay at the time. Yep, 
out of all the SCSI optical drives, this one was the cheapest, and it came with an interface card, which works fine. We used it in the K6 video, the, the little interface card it comes with, because obviously I don't need it for the Pentium. So, yeah, I stuffed it in there to get around the IDE interface not working in the K6. And, yeah, <laughs> it works absolutely fine. It... it it does get quite warm though when it's burning a disc and when it's working on a disc you've got this little fan on the back i think it probably needs that <laughs> you know use a lot of power but yeah overall I'm, I'm quite amazed i did not expect for one second that i would actually get this thing to work and as i said it just blows my mind that there's now technically a piece of that machine that exists outside of that machine it's going to come in useful if I ever have to restore those drive images, I suppose, and I won't have to get them onto the hard drive first. So, yeah, back to that dweeb in front of that camera, I guess, again. You know, thinking about it, there might actually be something to this. I mean, at the very least, it gives you a bragging right. I mean, I can now stand here and be like, oh, well, yeah, your DOS machine... Windows 3.1 machine, whatever. <laughs> it plays old games. Well, mine burns them, so screw you. But I'm not sure what use that is, given the abundance of burners in modern machines now, and even when they're not included, how cheap they are to obtain. I mean, they're certainly not in four-figure numbers like they were when this sort of stuff was around. You know, almost everybody now could easily access one, I would think. So yeah, that's, uh, that's it. As you can see, this process wasn't always so easy, and I, I would have liked to be able to go farther back with this to those early awkward barners, but I don't have one, and I can't really get hold of one. I doubt if I could make it work, and I'll be honest, this is a field which is really badly documented. There's almost no history of this written down other than like a basic outline. I don't know if it's just that it wasn't particularly well publicised or, you know, maybe they were really careful about publishing specifications or something. I don't know, but hell, I mean, that setup that we talked about that probably would have cost you like between thirty-five and fifty thousand dollars you know, my house is probably barely worth more than that. Uh, I mean, if you want to repair it, it's going to cost more than that. <laughs> But, yeah, uh, I don't think that was something average Joe would have had access to back then. And it is something I want to start emphasising more with this, is the inherent problem with channels like mine is we do tend to showcase best-case scenario. People didn't really own this stuff at the time. And maybe we should occasionally have a look at a sort of realistic scenario. And I, I might start doing that every once in a while, you know, just realism, this is the machine you might have earned in 1994 or whatever, because, yeah, you wouldn't have had something like this. It just wouldn't have happened. This would have been a, a very specific machine. It would have been a special purpose. You would have probably had to order it built specifically. It's not something that would have been produced in hundreds of thousands quantities. It would just never have sold. Especially with the barner in it. I mean, they're just didn't exist. Anyway, I'm going to uh, cut this for today because I, I am probably about to pass out. I, I don't do warm weather. Uh, a lot of uh, ginger genetics in my, on my mother's side, so maybe that's something to do with it. Me and the son up there, we just have this this mutual disagreement with one another. I don't burn either. If I stand out, I just go kind of off yellow colour and it's quite disgusting. I look like I got jaundice or something. <laughs> so, it's probably not a good idea really, is it? So, with that, I think we've covered what there is to cover here. And uh, the neighbourhood probably thinks I'm some kind of uh, absolute weirdo for just filming random stuff in my back garden, but, well, fuck them. They that's the problem for just watching me film stuff, isn't it? I, I don't think they are. I doubt if they could give a fuck, really. I'm not bothering them. They're not bothering me. Seems a fair enough agreement to me. So, I'm High Treason. Thanks for watching. And I'm out of here. Well, actually, I'm in here on this one, I guess. See you next time when, hopefully, I'm not passing out from the 
starting some degrees it is in my house. Here's a weird thing. Did anybody ever realise how uh, my old house number looked like ISO? You know, like the CD images and stuff. Yeah, well, no, no shit. The day I signed for it, the, the key ring had this little bit of cardboard on, which I've still got somewhere, I'm pretty certain. Uh, I kept reading it as ISO Preston Road. <laughs> so, oh, that's, that's just wonderful. Hey, actually, you're not thinking about it, that place they tried shoving me in before I got this place. That looked like ISA. That was like 154. Yeah, uh, kind of weird, really. Number of this place has no relevance to anything, I don't think. Uh, I'm not going to tell you what it is, but yeah, it's pretty boring, really. And doesn't match a sequence of everywhere that I have lived. There's, there's like this odd sequence that follows my family with house numbers. Uh, maybe I'll explain that someday, but... Anyway, <laughs> ISO Preston Road. It was the house of burnt CDs.